Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to uh, the last day of the public course, of the last public day of this course, as you students are looking ahead to reading week. Uh, welcome to community members who have routinely gathered or sometimes less routinely gathered uh, to join this series. My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm associate vice chancellor uh, uh, for the arts and design here at UC Berkeley and also a professor in rhetoric and a professor in theater, dance, and performance studies. Students here and community members may or may not know that uh, the Office of Arts and Design is behind this public course, uh, both as a backstage coordinator and a front stage promoter. And it is conceived originally and has progressed um, in many forms in order to introduce students to a range of creative practices from around the campus, across visual arts, across performing arts, literature, design, film, uh, always unified by a central theme. This year's, this, uh, year's theme has, of course, focused on issues of migration and transformation. This course also allows stellar faculty and visiting artists like Peter Glazer and in absentia Stan Lai to serve as masters of ceremonies over a series of events and dialogues, both the course itself that is uh, sometimes closed to the public and then also opens once a week to the public. I'm excited to be here for the very last of, a, the, of this lecture series and to thank Peter and his partner Stan for being such luminous and hardworking faculty, to thank uh, our GSIs, Christian and Peiting, to thank BAM PFA and their staff, and also to thank my staff, A plus D staff, and especially the person who has functioned as thought leader, stage manager, dramaturg um, uh, behind this course, Les Gorski. Finally, none of this would have been possible without the philanthropic generosity of a range of um, institutions and individuals, especially the Mellon Foundation and its support of Cal Performance's educational programs, and most especially the incredible generosity of Charles and Lillian Huang, who have supported uh, every dimension of Stan Lai's residency, both the production of a brand new work, which is sold out, but I'll tell you it opens this weekend, and also this public course. So uh, having been um, reminding you all, as I've reminded students sometimes that things like this take a village, help me thank this village, A plus D's village. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's on behalf of this team that I also want to thank all of you who have been joining this Thursday lecture series, and especially those of you who are here for House of the Spirits, a conversation with Isabella Allende, Caridad Speech, and moderated by Michael Moran. As you know, throughout the semester, Stan and Peter have convened you weekly to think about issues of creativity, migration, um, and migration, and we're going to get deeply inside those themes, uh, thinking uh, about the work of Isabella Allende and uh, Michael Moran and uh, Caridad Speech's engagement with it. I'm going to let Peter do the introduction of this incredibly luminous team that we have gathered here. And I'll, in doing that, I'll get to uh, ask you to uh, thank Peter one more time as we change over, thank him for his hard work, and welcome him to the stage to introduce the last conversation in the series. Peter. It's the nature of these events that you have to hear all the people talking about the event before you get to actually experience the event. So uh, we'll try to get to that as quickly as possible. Um, but thank you, Shannon, and, and just to say that it's Shannon's vision that has allowed this kind of a conversation to happen, has brought students into this classroom and has brought you into this event and has brought our amazing guests into this room. So uh, two very quick things before I introduce our guests. This is a class. And I will remind Pei Ting's students in the 4 o'clock section that you need to check your email or check with Pei Ting because you might have to move to another space. So if you're in that section, please do. Anyone who wants to attend Pei Ting's section, come along. Why not? Enjoy it. Um, I will also say that the House of the Spirits, which is the center of this conversation, opens tomorrow night here on the UC Berkeley campus, directed by Michael Moran. 
and you'll hear more about that. There will be cards if anyone is interested in the possibility of attending the performance this weekend or next weekend. It is not sold out, unlike Stan's play, and you would have that opportunity. Okay, so it is this, uh, this series and this production that has been the instigation for bringing this amazing panel together to talk to you today. They will, they will uh, engage in a conversation for 50 minutes and then uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions. So our moderator, Michael Socrates Moran, grew up in Richmond, California before attending Boston University where he pursued a BFA he has worked as a professional actor in regional theaters around the country. He's a graduate of UC San Diego's world-renowned MFA directing program, where he founded the award-winning Ubuntu Theater Project, one of the most exciting new theater companies in the Bay Area, a professional theater company based in Oakland, dedicated to inspiring compassion across socioeconomic and racial barriers. He now serves as Ubuntu's administrative and artistic director, executive and, and, and uh, artistic director. He has directed over 15 productions. Uh, favorites include Dance of the Holy Ghosts by Marcus Gardley, Othello by William Shakespeare, Yellow Man by Dale Orlandsmith, the West Coast premieres of To the Bone and Exit Cuckoo, A Nanny Motherland by Lisa Ramirez, and the world premiere of Rashomon by Philip Kahn Gatanda, who is in the audience today. Michael is the recipient of the San Francisco Bay Area Theater Critics Circle Award for Best Director in the East Bay. Kardotsvich, who is here today, received a 2012 Obie Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Theater, a 2012 Edgar Foundation, Edgerton Foundation New Play Award and Rolling World Premiere for Guapa, and the 2011 American, Critics, American Theater Critics Association Primus Prize for her play, The House of the Spirits, based on Isabel Allende's novel. She has won the National Latino Playwriting Award twice, including the year 2013 for her play Spark. She has been shortlisted for the Penn Award in Drama four times, including in the year 2012 for her play Magnificent Waste. Her works in English and Spanish have been seen at venues across the US and abroad, among the Marina Stage, Denver Theater Center, 59 East 59, the Women's Project, Repertorio Español, Ensemble Studio Theater, and theaters in the UK, Chile, Germany, Uzbekistan, Costa Rica, Wales, and Canada. Key works in her repertoire include 12 Ophelias, Iphigenia Crash Land Falls on the Neon Shell that was once her heart, the Booth Variations, and Jarman, All This Maddening Beauty. She has also adapted for the stage novel by, novels by Mario Vargas Llosa, Julia Alvarez, and Jose uh, Jose Leon Sanchez and has radically reconfigured works from Vedican, Euripides, Sophocles, and Shakespeare. And in keeping with our other guests, she has had a great deal of work in the areas of social justice and the arts, a founder of Theater Alliance and Press No Passport. Her work has intersected with communities of multiple diversities with works responding to the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the U.S. Gulf region, veterans and their families, survivors of trauma, and those committed to artistic expression of precarity advocacy for US Latinx writing voices and engagement with the representations of the fragile shores in our lives. And finally, of course, Isabel Allende, novelist, feminist, and philanthropist, is one of the most widely read authors in the world, having sold more than 74 million books. Born in Peru, yes. Born in Peru and raised in Chile, Isabel won worldwide acclaim in 1982 with the publication of her very first novel, The House of the Spirits, House of the Spirits, which began as a letter to her dying grandfather. Since then, she has authored more than 23 best-selling and critically acclaimed books, including Of Love and Shadows, Ava Luna, Daughter of Fortune, Island Beneath the Sea, Paula, and the Japanese Loverland in the Midst of Winter. Translated into more than 42 languages, Allende's works entertain and educate readers by interweaving imaginative stories with significant historical events. In addition to her work as a writer, Allende devotes much of her time to human rights causes. In 1996, following the death of her daughter Paula, she established a charitable foundation in her honor, which has awarded grants to more than 100 nonprofits worldwide delivering life-changing care to hundreds of thousands of women and girls. More than eight million have watched her TED Talks on leading a passionate life. She has received 15 honorary doctorates, including one from Harvard University, was inducted into the California Hall of Fame, received the Penn Center Lifetime Achievement Award, 
and the Annis Field Wolf Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2014, President Barack Obama awarded Allende the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor, and in 2018, she received the Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters from the National Book Foundation. She lives right here in California. Please welcome Michael Moran, Kari Dodsevich, and Isabel Allende to the stage. On? Great. Is this on? I'm not very lucky with these phallic microphones. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, so t to begin, we, uh, we were talking a little bit out there before we came in, and since this class is focused on migration as one of its themes, um, we wanted to begin with talking about beginning the novel as you were living in exile and what that meant then and, and how that you reflect upon that now. Well, originally I was a lousy journalist. And then uh, when I went, uh, after the military coup in Chile in 1973, I ended up in Venezuela where, of course, I couldn't find a job as a lousy journalist. And I did all sorts of odd jobs to make a living, but I was sick with nostalgia for my country. Being a political refugee is different from being uh, an immigrant because you are forced out of your country and uh, you don't have many choices and you can't go back. So you're always looking back, not looking forward as an immigrant usually is. So in that state of mind, uh, my grandfather started to get very ill and then died in Chile and I started a letter for him that became my first novel. I had no idea what I was doing. But I, in a way, was uh, capitalizing on my, my experience as an immigrant, as being uprooted, not having, I mean, having lost what, what I thought was everything. I didn't know that I was gaining other things while I was losing the past. So that's how the House of the Spirits began. And it is the story of a family. It's the micro world of a family that is reflected or paralleled by the macro world of the country. So both stories intertwine, and that, that's the book. Of course, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just writing and writing without, without a script or without an, uh, even not knowing if it, this was a novel or a memoir of my family or a chronicle of Chile. I didn't know what it was, but I was lucky, <laughs> really lucky. Kaida, can you speak a little bit about how you came to the novel and how you decided to adapt it? Yes, um, I've, I've written a lot of plays and uh, a lot of them have been reconfigurations of the classics. So working with Euripides and working with Baedeker and working with Shakespeare and particularly Euripides and Shakespeare mainly um, uh, when I decide to do, when I decide to have those interactions as a writer. And, uh, and so Repertorio Español is a company in New York uh, that's been around for uh, 50 years. Um, uh, has a tradition of doing uh, adaptations of novels uh, on stage, uh, and they had never done one from a female author. Uh, so <laughs> it's about bloody time that they did. Uh, and so uh, they approached me, and uh, uh, kind of kind of out of the blue, and, you know, and and they said, "Oh, what well, you'd be interested in?" and and I was like, well, of course, Isabel, like, you know, this novel, like, has to happen on stage. And I know I knew it had had a production in London some years before uh, in, a dura in a long, sort of longer form durational perform uh, it was so production. So boring. Yeah, he was so, so boring. boring. <laughs> uh, it, it lasted like six hours. You had to watch one day, three hours, then go for dinner, and then the next day come back. I mean, there were more people on the stage than in the audience. <laughs> I hope it's not the case with yours, Karina. No, it's not the case with mine. So, so I knew of that one, and I and I and I sort of had a hunch that I, that I wanted to do something that was um, compact, that felt like felt like it was in one breath. 
Uh, and I was really just, uh, you know, it's it's one of my favorite books. And it's also, uh, this, you know, this was during the, the Bush administration, remember, W? Uh, and, so, and so I just, uh, I was thinking a lot about Abu Ghraib, uh, which somehow we don't seem to be talking about anymore. Um, and so, and I, and I just, and I, and I think, you know, sometimes when you're a playwright, you know, people ask you, what are you writing about the now? What's happening now? And like, write the play about now. And I was like, well, actually, this story is happening now. <laughs> and, 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 and I felt like a synergy between, um, you have to come with a passion, expressivity for, for why do you want to make something as an artist? And, and also, and, I, and I'm feeling really angry, and, and I tend to write a lot out of, out of, out of creative outrage uh, and try to channel that outrage into something positive, which is making art um, and healing, hopefully, from that art. And so, and so this, this sort of happens sort of at the same time. And then, you know, I was just lucky, lucky, uh, that Repertorio said yes. You know, they said yes, and they were like, go forward. And, and then it just became a conversation and, uh, to make it happen. And, and uh, I'm very grateful that, um, you know, I think when you make, art, because I know this is part of your class, <laughs> art making, um, um, it's a leap of faith. And the leap of faith sometimes comes from you as the artist, but it also comes from all these people, you know, it takes a village, as Shannon said, people around you who just say, okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's try to help keep that leap of faith going. So, so yeah, that's how it happened. Can, can you talk, well, maybe both of you talk a little bit more about what you just said about uh, it being healing and coming from the outrage and, and the art being healing in some way? Well, I think that, uh, at, can you hear me? I can't hear myself. Um, at the time when I was living in Venezuela, I, I think that I was sort of sick with nostalgia for my country and for the past and for the family. And I also was in pain because people were dying in Chile, and not only friends, and, but also my people from my family and my grandfather. So um, there was there was this this feeling uh, of, of being wounded, of having lost a lot. And uh, writing The House of the Spirits was like a crazy attempt to recover what I had lost, to bring it back to me. And the idea of putting it in paper and writing the story is a way of, of making it permanent, of saving it from oblivion. In that sense, it was very healing. And I, I had another experience like that in which a, a work of creativity can heal. After, in 1992, my daughter Paula died premature death, very young. And uh, I was really paralyzed with sorrow and pain. My daughter died on December 6, 1992. And I started all my books on January 8th. So a month later, I still could not recover from what had happened. And my mother said, what are you going to write on January 8th? And I said, nothing. How could I write? And she said, if you don't write, you'll die. You have to write. And so I locked myself in a room and I started writing. I would say that that's a book written with tears. And I wrote the story of my daughter, my country, my family. Everything is in there. And during that year of writing, I wouldn't say that I healed from the pain, but I understood it, and I could accept it, and I could deal with it. And since then, I have found out that often in my life, by writing about something, even if it's fiction, and it doesn't appear to be related to what's happening to me, I am healing something. Something is happening because I chose that story and no other story. I chose those characters to talk for me, to experience what I was experiencing. I get letters, messages, people who come to me all the time saying, I have this wonderful life, I want you to tell it. <laughs> and and you, you, you only have to give me half of the, of the royalties and I'll tell you my story. Because you know, you can write, I, I live the story, so you write it and you just give me half. And I say, fine, but I can't write like that. I can only write what is related to my own experience. Can we speak at all about healing? Oh, it's a hard one. I mean, I think that um, I can only, you know, I mean, only, but I, I'm sort of in the middle of a, pro of a project right now. and. Um, 
I can express it through the idea of uh, facing the page. And, uh, and I think that one of the things that happens is the more you write, Sam Shepard used to have this phrase, oh, the late Sam Shepard, I used to have this phrase where he, he used to say, um, you know, uh, the more you write, the harder it gets in a weird way because you know more. You know more about not just life, but you know more about technique and craft and what is possible and what is not and what works and what doesn't. You know, and, and so sometimes your writerly brain interferes with that pure moment of just, oh, uh, this has to happen, this has to get out. What I call the urgency in writing, the urgency that's transmitted on the page that when as a reader uh, or an audience, you feel that. You feel the spirit of that, even if, if the lo writer is long past. You know, you feel that in, you feel it in the vibrations of the text, and so and so. I, I what I think I have to keep reminding myself is that I mean sometimes it's obviously you know I'm, I'm going through something and I'm like I have to write, but sometimes um, the technique is sort of looking at me and not letting me uh, meet that purity pure space, and so I have to kind of reconnect to that. And, and often what I do is um. Uh, I free write a great deal until I let the sometimes characters or voices, depending on how what mode I'm working in as a writer, um, they it's like they take over. And when that process of taking over happens, actually I think is when you're opening a gateway inside of yourself as an artist and whether you call it, you know, it can be healing, it can be, you know, not all writing comes from trauma, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I have friends, it's like perfectly fine, but then, you know, the writing expresses trauma. But I think that there's trauma in the world, and I think that one of the things that we do is kind of reflect that in the work, whether it's directly or indirectly. Um, and so meeting that, what I call that pure space to let the characters take over. Well, uh, in my foundation has been working for some time with refugees. Um, refugees in many places in the world, uh, and now we, I call them refugees, people who are running away for their lives and they are stuck waiting for asylum in the border. Mm -hmm. So we work with them. And um, what, what you were saying is how I feel about a theme that is in the world, a trauma that is in the world. And in, a w in one way or another, it comes in the writing. Mm -hmm. So my last three books, um, the Japanese Lover uh, in the Midst of Winter, and now the, the, another book that is coming out in English in January. Um, they are all about that. They are about this trauma of the world that is not only f for us here, but it's in Europe, it's in Africa, it's in Asia, in so many parts, masses of people that are uprooted and are looking for a place to be safe for them and their children. And that Trauma is there, like in, in, the, in our collective unconscious, in our collective soul. And, and we all have to deal with that in one way or another. Just, some people deal with it by ignoring it, and they don't want to hear about it. And other people, just, like myself, and I'm sure it's your case, and probably yours too, Michael, uh, we just cannot ignore it because it keeps knocking at your head all the time. So. In a way, we try to heal the world, maybe. It's very ambitious. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the phrase, the truth beyond truth, and the, and the greater story? <laughs> I, I've, I think I copied this from some Jewish saying, what is truer than truth? And the answer is the story. Sometimes fiction can touch the heart with a kind of truth that a documentary cannot. And there's an, I can give you an example. Many years ago, there was famine in Ethiopia. And the press was reporting everywhere. And so there was a point of saturation when people didn't want to hear about it. And, and, and you, you would see these masses of people starving to death, and people would not react. And a journalist in France followed the case of one woman, one woman who walked through the desert to get, try to get to a Red Cross tent with children and a baby, and how she barely survived and the children died. And the woman had a name, and the children had names, and they had faces. And one story of one person touched people in ways that nothing else had. And then it was discovered that she had sort of made it up. She, she didn't make up the tragedy. But she, she sort of created a fiction with this particular woman. Because in a way, 
how can you move people if you cannot relate to one to one human being? And that's what I do with my books, try to connect to the, to the emotion. I don't try to give facts or, or preach about anything, just connect to one story. You all remember the, the photograph of that little boy that was washed out in, in the beach in Turkey, the little Syrian toddler. His name was Alan Kurdi. And we all remember the image of that little boy with his sneakers and his t-shirt. And that's the face of refugees for many people. But if you talk about refugees in general, you may say there are 68 million refugees at this point, and it doesn't mean anything. But we think of Alan Kurdi, and then we can connect. So in that case, the story sometimes is truer than truth. Uh, one of the things is that there's these, these are very different forms, the novel and the play. And so to begin to talk about that, I'd, I'd love to hear what you look for in the other form. <laughs> uh, so what you look for in a novel, either to adapt or just for joy and pleasure, and what you look for in the, in the theater. Gosh, um, in a novel, I look for, I don't know if I'm looking for something. Do you know I'm a, when I'm just a reader, um, I want to be entr ent entranced by it. I want to be seduced by it. Um, I want it, the same thing that happens to me when I'm writing, where the, where the writing takes over, I want that to happen to me as a reader. I just want to take over me so that, that sometimes I'm walking around and I'm, I'm dreaming of the characters that in the novel and I'm walking around with them in my head during the day. When that happens, it's a, it's a delicious experience. And it also can happen in other forms. Um, I'm currently uh, reading uh, Ilya Kaminsky's extraordinary uh, poetry collection, Deaf Republic, which is in the form of a theater piece in a way. And in that piece, I'm constantly, I'm thinking about that village in the Ukraine that he's writing about, you know what I mean? And, and I'm, and those, the, the voices that he's describing are in my head. Um, so I'm looking for that feeling of intimacy, and I'm also looking for that feeling of directness, um, something to engage the imagination, and, and sometimes to take me, make me see the world anew, but also make, take me out of, out of the world that I'm in so that I can see it again. And I think that's that, it's that interesting process that happens when you're a reader. And I think when I'm adapting, uh, when I'm looking or when I'm kind of having that conversation of will that is that opportunity going to come through again uh, to engage with another form it comes first as the reader's experience um, and secondly usually as a as a theater maker's experience that that sort of hat enters into the ballpark later well i can't be very objective about this because many years ago when i was living in chile i worked in the theater i wrote some theater plays and I was very lucky because there was a theater company that was willing to put them on stage. And I worked behind the, 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 behind the stage, seeing how the actors got together, how they, um, they, they would each one embody the character and become the character, and how every performance changed the play. And sometimes the emotion was totally different for the audience with the same play. So when I go to the theater, I just can't be objective and say, this is a good play or a bad play. They are all good plays to me. They are all excellent. I love it. I love the smell of the theater. I love the curtain. I love the actors. And I believe everything they say. They can be talking bullshit. I don't care. I, I, I just want to be there, sitting in the theater and experiencing that wonderful moment when you are not you anymore. You are one of them on stage. It's fascinating. Unfortunately, I have never been able to repeat that in my life, to go back to the theater. Mm -hmm. you, need a, you need a team. Yeah. And in my work, I don't need anybody. I just need a computer and a cup of tea. That's it. It's cheap. Yeah. Really cheap. Karida, uh, can you talk about how you went about adapting it, what you selected, how you, how you formed it, and then I'd also love to hear that there's been a number of adaptations of your work and anything about how, seeing it all of a sudden jump to a new form, either in a film or well, a play. There, there have been the movie of the House of the Spirits and uh, the, the theater plays that Caridad and other people have put on stage, a ballet somewhere, and they have done an opera with one of my stories and, and other things. 
And I always feel very flattered that other people, other creators feel inspired by anything I have done. So people ask me, um, how do you feel about the movie? I feel great about the movie. Even if it's a bad movie, who cares? It's better than having nothing. And if it's a bad movie, they will say, oh, the book was better. <laughs> and, 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 if it's, and if it's a good movie, they will say, oh, I have to read the book. Right. So I can't lose. Yes. I can't lose, it's great. Yeah, I mean, choices around what to keep, what to take out, I mean, those are so technical. I mean, I, for, for me, I, you know, uh, when I, when an opportunity to adapt something comes my way and, or, or if I'm instigating it, and, and then the first thing that I ask myself is what's the running time, like in my head, just as a practical concern as a writer. Um, I knew I wanted to have two, about 215, two and a half, no more than, that sort of was my goal. Um, that meant that, well, you know, the novel's huge, so and it has many stories within stories, and and so I I knew fairly early on that obviously not all of it could be told, um, not if I wanted to keep the strong narrative engine alive that the novel has inside of it. So I made a map of the of the entire novel and sort of put it on my wall, uh, with just the different storylines and you know and timelines and you know trying to just hold it in my hand. I think that when you're a theater maker, you're trying to hold it in your hand because you want the audience eventually, when they encounter the work and have that beautiful encounter, to feel as if they are holding it in their hands. Uh, and I love that. I love that experience when I'm in the audience. So I'm trying to replicate that as a theater maker. So, so I was trying to figure out how do I hold this in my hands? <laughs> and I was really, really daunted, you know, but, but I was also feeling strangely happy. Um, I, and I mean that the, I mean that because the subject matter of the novel is uh, quite, there's a lot of violence, you know. It's it's very uh, it's written in a space of uh, uh, political violence and trauma. Uh, so I knew I had to walk into those waters as a writer, but I also was um, felt liber strangely liberated, um, uh, kind of like. I, you know, it's a very strange thing to describe, Michael and Isabel, but the the feeling of I was sitting at the computer and. I felt like um, go different theater ghosts were speaking to me. <laughs> um, so I'd be working on a scene, you know, and it's like, a, you know, Alba y Trevon, and then suddenly the ghost of Lorca would appear in my head, or the ghost of Calderon, or that, and it was like a very, you know, these are all people that I've uh, translated uh, in the past, so, so it, was a, it was a very strange sensation of having <clears throat> other, kind of theater makers from the past, imagine, my imaginary friends <laughs> uh, that I've worked with before, step into my writing space and actually inform decisions that I was making. Um, I've never had that happen before in my work. Um, and it was exhilarating. And so I think that, that that delight meant that I couldn't wait to write the next scene, which meant that as I was looking at the big map of the piece, I was trying to figure out, oh, if I go here next, what is, how would the audience react? And I was really thinking a lot about juxtapositions and thinking about uh, the framing device, I, the, using the framing device of Alba uh, in the no, uh, from, from the novel and using that in the play in a very, very strong way, in a very direct way. How, how, how do you feel, I mean, so the novel exists and, and we can pick it up, just as these different forms, we can pick it up and read it any time, and if we read it in 2019, it might have a different context than if we read it 10, 15 years ago. And same with the play. Uh, and with the play, there's some producer somewhere that's like, we're doing this now because it hopefully relates to now. Is there anything worth saying about how you think the story, the novel, and the adaptation relates to America in 2019? <laughs> well, I think uh, it's this is the story of a country, my country, Chile, that was a solid democracy, the, sol the most solid democracy in the continent for many, many years in South America, in Latin America. And um, we ha elected a socialist president in 1970. Three years later, we had a military coup propped up, prop up and supported by the CIA. This was in the, in the frame of the Cold War when they would not allow a socialist uh, government to succeed in Latin America. So um, the country changed in 24 hours. 
We thought, as a, as a democracy, that our institutions were strong enough to withstand the assault of anything. That, that our strong democratic tradition would upheld whatever happened, and we would be able to defend that democracy with its institutions and, and the democratic spirit of the Chileans, of us. It didn't happen. In 24 hours, everything disappeared. No freedom of the press, the Congress was eliminated, the, the, the judiciary system was um, suppressed, there were no political parties, that you couldn't even gather more than six people in a room without permission from the police. All this, which was unthinkable, happened in Chile in 24 hours. In 24 hours, we had concentration camps and torture centers. People disappeared, there was no habeas corpus. They, would, uh, they could arrest you uh, for indefinite time and you could disappear, and there was no explanation for the fact that your body was never found. To this day, they have not been found. Um, so all this that happened to us was so surprising, so unexpected, so in unbelievable, that it took us quite some time to realize that it was happening. Uh, the day of the military coup, Mexico sent a plane to, um, to offer asylum to Allende's, Salvador Allende was the president of Salvador Allende's family and closest uh, staff. I was from his family, so I was called. And I thought, what, this is crazy, why would I leave my country? It, this, this is a sort of historical accident, this is going to pass in 24, 24 more hours or 48 more hours, the, the military will go back to their barracks and they will call an election. I was completely ignorant and naive about what was going on, and so was the rest of the country. So by the time we reacted, a year had passed, and by then the, the system had been consolidated, and, and it took 17 years to get rid of the dictatorship. So when we think of terms of, of what happens today in the world, and we see the world turning toward populist, nationalist, and authoritarian governments all over, to turning to the right and to strong men. There seems to be a fascination with that. And that is explainable because we live in a world that is changing. Globalization has changed the world and the technology. It is like the, what happened with the industrial era, when all of a sudden the world turned industrial and the agricultural society that had been the, the way of living in the world ended. So it took, it, it took a long time to adapt, and that's what's happening now. So we turn toward what seems safer. And I see this, and I get panicky, because I've lived it before. And, and when people say, oh no, the institutions in the United States can support anything, I mean, we, we are safe. No, beware, nothing is safe, nothing is forever. Everything can change. And uh, we have to be aware of that and be, therefore, very alert. I wouldn't say vigilant because the word vigilant has a double meaning, but alert. Do you want to... Yeah, I mean, what can I add to that? I mean, and just why now, why now? This, this story, this sto these kinds of stories about uh, defending human rights, standing up for human rights, um, at all costs, uh, looking at systems of oppression uh, and how they are built and sometimes uh, can seduce us uh, by false means. Um, those are, you know, I, I would like to say these kinds of stories should never happen again, you know. Um, but unfortunately, they keep happening in the in the spin of in the wheel of history. So I feel like as writers, you know, and theater makers, illuminating those stories um, helps us remind, you know, what did Taylor Mack once say? So, theater is a reminder, you know? So it just reminds us. I'm sure he was t quoting somebody else. But, um, you know, we're here to remind ourselves. You know, we're here to remind ourselves. Oh, these things, ha these things happen. Re don't forget. Don't forget, you know? And, and I feel like that's a, one, one, of, one of the beautiful things that, that theater can do because it is a live form and because it is civic engagement that, that through these acts of storytelling, uh, and being with one another, 
in the human encounter that, that we can be reminded and hopefully carry inside of us the spirit of, if it's not there already, um, to take action, to be more alert, uh, and to not, I would say, I've been having this discussion with a friend recently, but to not rest on this idea of hope as being the, hope as a kind of um, a tangible thing that will just happen by its own means, you know what I mean? <laughs> but hope as a thing that's actionable uh, and that you, that we need to sort of as a society uh, in defending democracy and democratic principles um, strive for and, and care for in terms of their, our fellow humans. What, what is also interesting is that the great stories, I'm not talking about myself, but the great stories that we keep seeing in different forms, in the theater, in movies, in play, in whatever, those are eternal. Mm -hmm. They were written 500 years ago or whatever, and you, we can have them actualized today, modernized, or even in the original form, and they still work. Mm -hmm. Why do they work? Because they, um, they, they target the basic human emotions that we all feel everywhere. I have traveled the world, and people feel the same everywhere. We all feel hatred, love, hope, fear, friendship, um, anger, hope in the same way. Everywhere. We all have liver, we all have heart, we all have kidneys. We are not different. And that's why those stories work, because because they, they are eternal. We keep making the same mistakes. And, and we repeat the same stupid errors that we've done 500 years ago. We do it again and again. So the stories still work, unfortunately. Can you both talk about being um, a Latin American and female writer in your respective industries <laughs> and fields? Being a Latin American writer is not a good thing. Uh, it's good in Latin America. <laughs> but in the United State, States, um, people are not used to translation. So um, there are great books written today in France, in Italy, in Germany, and we have never heard of them because there is a reluctancy to publish books in translation because there is this idea that the American readership is simple-minded. Um, to give you an example, I'm lucky because I'm, I'm translated into English and I have very good publishers. Often the editor says to me, you know what, we will, we will just move this paragraph here so that the Americans will understand. I say, what? So the idea is that you all have the mentality of a 14-year-old kid and we have to make it simple so that you will understand. No, why? Why that idea? And so the, it's the same with movies. How many movies that are created in Europe or in Asia or in Africa do you get to see only in festivals? Mm -hmm. But commercial movies, you don't see because there's also this idea that we cannot read subtitles. <laughs> what is this? So it, for, be, for a Latin American writer, female or male, it's hard if we write in Spanish. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, as a theater maker that sort of works in both Latin America and, and the States and in Europe, uh, I find that a uh, sort of conundrum when I'm working with material where the subject matter is, it's either its origin or if I'm writing it originally in Spanish and then I'm translating myself into English, as I did with House, which I wrote, where I wrote two versions of the play, one in Spanish and one in English for different audiences. Um, there's a, there's a, oh gosh, I can, I can give you a small anecdote, which is when I did it at Denver Center, beautiful production, um, the head of the theater at the time uh, walked up to me after the opening night. Everybody was very proud, and he said, oh, Chile. I forgot that Chile existed. You know, like, it was just like a thing, like, it just never was not in his worldview, you know, and I was just like, a story from Chile. Well, of course, why couldn't that be on a U.S. stage? So I think that there's a... I, I think it's sort of unfortunate, and I think I think maybe it's changing slightly. Um, I think television is changing. Television. Yes, because now television is doing what the movies never did. Yeah, and so you know, but finding finding the, I think in theater often it's like the people saying, "Oh, how can we sell the story?" And it's like, 
stories are, you know, stories, we all feel the same thing. It's very easy to sell a story, sex and violence. Yes. A lot of violence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I wrote a trilogy for young adults. And another book that is also for young adults called Sorro. And I get all the time messages from teachers or, or, or parents saying, is there any sex in these books? Nobody asks about the violence. Nobody. I mean, kids, toddlers can, can have a lot of violence, but no sex, no, not that. So I always tell them, no, there's no sex at all. Let them be surprised. <laughs> Can you both talk about um, engaging your audience is something we spoke about before in terms of the value of entertainment and engagement, how to, you know, in a novel, how to grab, make sure. Oh, in a novel it's easy. Dickens said it, make them laugh, make them cry, but above all, make them wait. What, what do you hold back? What do you don't say? What do you suggest? That's the, what the tension is essential. I think in the theater is the same. It's the same. We're storytellers, so this is sort of our medium. The medium is the play the waiting game and the withholding game. And so, I, I mean, I think the withholding game in the theater is interesting because it's 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 nominally about um, where do you leave the space for the audience to be inside of it. Um, and I, when I'm working with students, you know, I always tell them, you know, um, there's always a gap when you're writing plays. You know, you're, the gap is that the audience is your collaborator. And so you just think, keep reminding yourself of that, that if it's all there, there's nothing, there's no work for the audience to do. Uh, so you better make sure that the audience has work to do. And work meaning, it could be joyful work, it could be, you know, uh, passionate work, but, but it's work that they're kind of invited into the experience. And you need to create those place, spaces of invitation. We should get the audience now, yeah. no? Yeah. Questions? <laughs> yeah, over there. Yeah, we can repeat the question also. Uh, yeah, let me see if we can hear her and then we repeat the question. Oh, okay. Ah, you're recording. Sorry, sorry. I told you these microphones don't work. Working oh, oh working with putting um, Latin American stories on stage uh, or even through literature. And I was wondering how you translate it, not the language per se, but the culture and the identities that come with the culture. And if when you do that in literature or in stage, you take in account your audience or you keep your authenticity about you know, your culture, identity, who you are, and the very real stories that you lived. Um, and if you should take in account your audience, um, and sort of like how you do that for the American stage, still keeping pride in your Latin American identity. Thank you. Oh my, that's like a long question. Um, uh, you know, no, I'm sorry, no, that's great. Um, uh, I, can, you can, I think you can only tell the truth of the story you're telling. So if you're open and responsible, responsible like as a writer to their, your character's flaws, their contradictions, their passions, uh, their frailties as humans, um, if you're speaking that truth, it will, it will broaden out. I mean, I, I think that it, you know, and of course it depends on whether you're working on historical material and, you know, I mean, there's so many layers to this in terms of the act of writing, but that core act of truth telling, um, is key, and if you don't have that, then it, it, you know, in a way, it won't, it won't actually touch, touch that audience member because you don't. I mean, especially in the theater, God knows, I have no idea who's going to be in the audience. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it, which is beautiful. It's beautiful and it's scary and it's vulnerable. So that vulnerability of like, join, join me in the story, and my job as a writer is 
hopefully, I'm going to take care of you. Trust me. I know what I'm doing a little bit. <laughs> and I'm going to take care of you through this. You know, And you may not always know exactly where it's going to go, but hey, you're invited along for the ride. Eventually, trust me, I'll get you there. Um, I feel like that's my job. Uh, and, and I think that, that, that uh, writing theater is also being a laborer. It's being like a, a worker, yeah? Well, in my case, I never think of the audience because I don't know who the readers are. And the readers might be in 42 languages. So who knows how the book is translated in Vietnamese or in Cambodian? I have no idea. Um, so, but, but to me, what is important is to tell the story, as you said, from a place of truth something that is very important for me. I'm not cheating to myself. I am, I am really writing about what I care for, what I believe. And I think that the reader, no matter where that reader might be and in which language, will or will not connect to my feelings. I cannot cater to the feelings or the culture of each reader. That would be impossible. Here's another question. Yeah, wait for the mic here. Oh. Okay. Okay, you first, and then then you here. All right, thank you. Um, so I have a question about magical realism because you've talked about sort of the political and familial origins of your story, um, but there's really something very fantastical about the world that the characters inhabit and the things that happen there. And I'm curious if that is part of the family story or a reaction to the political or where that comes from for you. Well, first of all, there's nothing fantastical in my book. There are things that may be unexplainable, but there is a difference between magic realism in the Latin American style and fantasy. Fantasy is Harry Potter. And magic realism is always founded in some experience that you can, in, in a manifestation. Uh, there is no invisibility cloak, but there are invisible Indians in the Amazon because they paint their bodies in the colors of nature and they walk so swiftly that you don't see them. They are three yards away and you don't see them. So that's, that would be like the difference. In something that may be totally magical has some kind of explanation. Garcia Marquez once said that uh, the, the fishermen were fishing out of the sea elephants and monkeys and clowns. And what was that about? And that's not fantasy. There was a hurricane that picked up a circus and threw it in the middle of the Pacific. So that's what happened. So <laughs> there's always an explanation of some kind. And in my case, I come from a family of weird people. Uh, my grandmother was a lunatic, thank God. So with a family like mine, you don't have to invent anything. <laughs> I grew up, at, well, not, not for a long time, but in my early childhood, when I was living with my grandmother, there were seances to call the spirits every Thursday. And there was a table where they would call the spirits, and according to a very heavy Spanish table that I now have in my house. And according to the legend, the table would jump, yes, two jumps for yes, one jump for no, and the spirits would reply whatever questions you had. It never worked quite well, but it somehow worked. I have the table in my house, and because maybe I don't quite believe in this thing, it has never moved, not at all. But it did move to my grandmother. So what is magic realism really? It's accepting that the world is a very mysterious place. And that not, not everything that we can explain, control, or sell is the only thing that exists. There are many things that happen to us all the time. Coincidences, prophetic dreams, that feeling that we've been in a place, that we've met this person before, these connections that we have with, with something that seems to be like a spirit world, faith, prayer, crystals, all those astrology, all those things that we believe in and we practice and we cannot explain. That's what we accept in our lives and in literature in most of the world. And what is systematically ignored or denied in industrialized nations because you want to have an explanation for everything and there is none sometimes. Now, to translate that, into theater or, or a screen is almost impossible. 
because I remember when they did the movie of the House of the Spirits, the Danish director, Billy August, said to me, I cannot have a person with green hair in the, in the movie because in, in the book, this woman with green hair that can be imagined by the reader. Any, any shade of gray, any kind of hair, but in a, in a movie, it's a green wig, and it will always look like a green wig. So to create that sense of the magical, I think that Almodovar does it, Guillermo del Toro does it. I mean, there are some movies that, have, that are extraordinary in that sense. But it's difficult. Um, good? Okay. Um, yeah, so my name is Ruben. Um, I come from a family that experienced uh, global migration and also from an undocumented family. Um, my mom was undocumented, but I have citizenship both in Mexico and in the U.S. So coming to college, I was the first one in my family to go to college, and now I work with students who are the first ones to go to college themselves. And many times the conversations that we have is about imposter syndrome and survivor's guilt and how do you navigate the world once you leave college because you're going to have experiences that your families weren't able to have. And how do you bring your full authentic self to that? So I'm curious about your experience because you have so many of those similar experiences and how you've been able to um, move in a way that allows you to be healthy and be generative and how that influences the art because you're having experiences that maybe the families that you come from never got a chance to experience. Well, I think that's the, the, the fate of humanity. We evolve. Each generation experiences what the previous generation did not. Um, I have never experienced that imposter syndrome, that feeling that you shouldn't be there. That, look, I didn't even finish high school, barely finish high school. And I have a doctorate from Harvard. When I was receiving the doctorate, I said, what the heck? I mean, these people are totally nuts. <laughs> and, but I didn't feel like an imposter. I felt that they were wrong, not me. <laughs> and, and the guilt, the guilt because other people stayed in Chile, suffered terribly. Many of my, not many, but some of my friends disappeared. Some of my relatives were killed. Um, I don't feel guilty because I, I saved myself and, and my children. I don't feel guilty about that. I feel furious that I had to experience that and that other people had to suffer what they suffered. But I feel that by being where I am now and writing from this safe place, I have been able to do a lot to let people know what happened. If I had stayed in Chile, I wouldn't be here today. I would be dead. So I don't feel guilty about that. And I think that what you have to tell the, the students, your students that feel that way, is that, for God's sake, be grateful that you can do this and go back to your parents and give them the gift of what you have and what you have achieved. I'm asked all the time by Latinos in, in immigrants, many undocumented, that say, they say that they feel that they have to choose between this culture and what they brought with them. I say, why do you have to choose? You can have both. You don't have to choose. You can be bicultural, which is, uh, you, you can be richer. You can have more. More is more. That this thing that more is less or less is more, they, I thought, what's that crap? More is more, less is less. And, and we, will, we want more of everything. Hello, hello. Hello. You said that uh, things were being done in television that had never been done in film before. Uh, I, if you can, could you elaborate on that? And also specify if you're talking about just uh, like a broadcast television or TV shows like uh, you know short form episodes that might have many seasons that could appear on streaming services as well, since those are very popular now. Yeah. Well, many books that would, not, would be impossible to do almost impossible to do in a movie, they do now in miniseries. And they, they are really very, very successful. It's, let, let, let me give you just one example, The Handmaid's Tale, uh, that was so successful that now they are creating a second season and a third season 
with a book that, that they thought they could do in one season of eight uh, episodes. And that's happening more and more. And they are looking also for uh, books from Latin America or from Spain because there is a large Spanish-speaking audience that watches TV all the time. So and we, we have this culture in Latin America of the teleseries. Uh, of course, the teleseries is just something, I mean, long, long, like a dragon tail. Um, but but in, for the American audience, it's working very well to do the miniseries, which we couldn't be able to do in, in movies. They would not be interested in the movies. So now they're going to do a miniseries with the House of the Spirits, which I think will work better than the movie, because there's more time. For it. I think we can take one more question or two. Uh, hello. <laughs> Who is the hello? <laughs> Me. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, there's a novel by Paulo Freire, a Brazilian writer that talks about, it's called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It's, co it's called what? The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And it's a system of teaching against, like, the system of oppression. And the main theme of it is that to break a system of oppression, what you need to do is not try to balance the people. What you have to do is break the system itself and recreate it. So my question is on the value of fantasy. Since in both the theater and in both writing, what you do is create essentially a, sa a fantasy for the reader to like immerse themselves in. My question is on the value and how you manage that fantasy so that the reader can like, I guess, immerse themselves to the fullest and really achieve whatever goal you're trying to achieve. I don't think that, w that what we create is a fantasy that is not grounded on something. And it, there are many ways of, of uh, interpreting, understanding um, reality and breaking the system. And art has always been very important to the point that every time that you have an authoritarian regime, the first to perish are the artists and the journalists, people who can move the, the pu public opinion. And art has a Im very important role in that. So that's why in Chile during the dictatorship, almost all artists, inclu including musicians and, and visual artists, left. They couldn't work in Chile because nothing was allowed. And everything was felt by the authoritarian regime as threatening, because it is threatening. It makes people think. What would you say? No, I mean, I, I just, I agree, and I also feel like uh, uh, art has, a, has the power to, is art is free, and I think that's why it's attacked often. There's the freedom of the imagination, what, what cannot, it can go anywhere, and I think you can't contain it, and I think that's what, what, what is its greatest, uh, in a way, for authoritarian regimes, for systems of oppression, is its greatest threat. Well, and there, sometimes art in one image or in one sentence can summarize an event, can summarize a feeling that nothing else could do in that way. Let's think, for example, of the painting by Picasso, Guernica. Guernica is a painting about the, the bombing of the city of Guernica in the Basque country during the Civil War in Spain in 1936. And, uh, he, he created this painting that is today in a museum, and in a way it summarizes the whole civil war. If we, if we think of the civil war in Spain, it's Guernica. If we think of Vietnam, it could be summarizing the photograph of that little girl that is running with napalm exploding behind her, and she's all burnt, running naked. That picture summarized the whole war. So that's what art can, art can do. And we have to, therefore, allow art to express itself abundantly. Because for that picture of the little girl, millions of pictures were taken in the war to create that image that would strike a chord in every human being. So I think art needs money, <laughs> audience, and freedom. Very important. There couldn't be a better place to bring this to a close. Thank you both, all of you, very, very much. Michael, Isabel, and Caridad. And thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. <laughs>